Nefarious USB cables, this time on Hack5. Hello, welcome to Hack5. My name is Darren Kitchen, and on this week's episode, we have once again in studio our friend MG. What's up, man? Hijinks hey. are abound. Good to be back. I know, right? Uh, it's wearing the same clothing, too. Imagine that. Um, so we, we got a great, uh, uh, I'm assuming a lot of great response from doing some fun stuff with uh, exploding USB drives and doing keystroke injection and stuff. You then didn't stop there, right? Yeah, so a uh, Southern California DEF CON group reached out to me and said, we would love to do a build party on Mr. Self-Destruct. Uh, the problem with that is, if you remember from the last show, doing a lot of taping and all this really non-standard work. Right, I mean, this yeah. this looks kind of cool. I mean, I love the idea that you can quickly prototype with a, if I can focus, board like this, which, uh, which is pretty cool in of itself, but I can imagine that when you've got 30 uh, people, you know, trying to put together one of these, that's going to be uh, a little bit more challenging. So what was your, how did you solve that? Well, immediately I knew I'm going to have to create actual PCBs. Hence these guys. Yeah. Which uh, look pretty cool, actually. So how do you go about making your own PCB? I must admit, I've never done that. It's I've always just said, good okay, question. here's a, I know, you know, you just go into Eagle CAD, you, you make a board, you export a Gerber, you send it to a shop, and bam, there you go, right? You, knew, you know more than me, <laughs> at least when I started this. So yeah, I started looking around and yeah, hey, use Eagle CAD and all these other things. I, get Eagle CAD, look at it, and it's like, wow, there's going to be a decent learning curve for here for, for accomplishing this. And I don't know, I just didn't have the patience at the time. So I just asked the community, and I got a lot of um, suggestions. Uh, Express PCB, or is it PCB Express? Um, they uh, were a recommendation, and their model is you get three boards, mm -hmm shipped to you in like three days and you use uh, really easy software. That's their whole model. So, you know, tried out their software and it was actually relatively easy to get set up. I already had the layout in my mind. I could draw it on paper. I just needed to <laughs> needed get to... it made, awesome. right? So that got me there. And that's, that's where I got these boards from. And I love that this is like, yet again, that story. You know, I had the same kind of conversation years back with Mike Osman when he was developing the Ubertooth One, which was, you know, he wasn't a hardware guy. He was yeah. just like, I have this need and I need to make this, you know, Bluetooth device. And I guess I have to learn how to make boards. And it's one of those things where it's just the same way, like, hey, I need to rotate logs and, oh, cool, log rotate or, you know, bash script or whatever have you or you know, back in the NT4 days in a batch file, whatever have you, yeah, yeah. you learn what you need to do to get the thing done so that you can move on with your life. Yes. And in this case, you're like, look, it's a two layer board. Eagle CAD, cool. <laughs> Maybe we just start with the basics. And it sounds like you were able to very quickly go from this with a bunch of copper tape to this, which is a super tiny PCB. You can kind of see those traces there. Oh yeah, yeah. That looks nice. It's smaller too. <laughs> no joke. So actually, you were able to you know save a lot of space. Though I am noticing it is on a pretty thick PCB. What is that? Yes. So that's a 1.6 millimeter board, which is relatively standard, and mm -hmm. it's kind of the only offering um, I had available at the time. If I was doing this again, I would definitely try for a 0.4 or 0.2 millimeter board, uh, considering the goal being small. Right. So. Yeah. You definitely want and like. Tiny when when you're talking about like what you're doing next is implanting stuff. Yes. You know, yes. like I, I don't know about you guys, but did you all get <laughs> super inspired when uh, you know through the whistleblower uh, Edward Snowden the leaked ant catalog and suddenly you're like, ooh, those are those are the toys that the NSA is playing with. I want those. Why don't I have those? I, I know, those. right? That's, that needs to be on my Batman utility belt. Yes. Uh, and so it's like you know, roll your own. Why not? Uh, so a smaller, faster, cheaper, you needed to then take this and what pair it with, well, I guess in this terms, you're still using the same IC, right? Yes. So, you, so we talked about last week, you were yeah. scavenging this IC off of a cloned, uh, what was it called? DigiSpark. Again? DigiSpark. Yeah. And this is in a, a form factor that's that's what, with the little legs there? Uh, SOIC, so uh, eight, eight is just the number of legs on it. Cute. Yeah, that's the, the SOIC eight package. And it's an AT Tiny 85 chip that comes in multiple forms. This is one of their smaller ones, but they have a much smaller one called the QFN package. Right. So which this is guy on right that here board. has an 
even tinier chip. You can see that right there. Whoops. And uh, what's that package? Because that's like, I mean, it's not quite BGA, but it, it's yeah. tiny. I mean, the the contacts are underneath the chip, but it's, uh, I forget the QFN stands for it, but it, yes, yeah, QFN. And uh, in addition to being a smaller footprint on the board, uh, it's also a lot thinner. So I, I don't know, it's probably like a quarter of the uh, the height of the, the Soik 8, which uh, if I was going to reduce this even further, and I would love to, uh, you know, reduce the thickness of the board and switch over the QFN package. I, dude, I can only imagine, because like you've got this tiny, tiny PCB that's even got like vias going underneath other components just to make it even smaller. Yeah. You must be sitting there with like a pair of tweezers like, like don't have any coffee <laughs> that day because, yes. wow. And then you just hit yeah. it with a heat gun? What are you using? Yeah, so iron? actually, yeah, you mentioned uh, the, the footprint. So the default footprints when you kind of import like uh, a soy uh, footprint for your PCB program, it comes out and you know, it drops a standard size, which has a lot of tolerance built in for the for the chip to sit in various places, and and it allows for ease of soldering and other things like that. I didn't and care about any of those things. Manufacturability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I wanted small as possible, so I was shrinking it down as much as possible. I was the vias, which is the pass through of the board when you're connecting the top layer to bottom layer. I was putting those underneath the actual contacts of resistors and the uh, the Soik 8 package to just reduce the footprint as much as possible. But yeah, when I'm assembling this, I will I will pull off that little tiny piece, and uh, you gotta either tape it down or clamp it. I've I've been using foil actually because it doubles as a heat shield. And yeah, primarily what I will use is a uh, mini heat gun, like a reflow solder station. I will uh, heat one side of the board, use solder paste, uh, which melts down into solder that you know then attaches like you're used to, but it, it comes in a liquid form, so it's nice to instantly apply to all the, the locations. And I try to do one side at a time, and there's a lot of nudging. The parts are so close together, you have to nudge them uh, gently with the tweezers and kind of trace the foil around the edges of other components so they don't start getting uh, liquefied and dropping off the board. It's um, it's fun. <laughs> no, I love this too because you know you went into this without that kind of like uh, you know body of knowledge that a you know an electrical engineer would have, and at the same time like one might be watching now and, and just cringing. <laughs> yes, yeah, but on the other <laughs> hand, it might be one of those things where you're like, well, since I don't know the rules or the best practices, and what I'm trying to achieve is this, you can get a lot more creative and you know maybe explode some stuff along the way. But you know that's just part of the process. Yep. Oh, I, I definitely lost. Uh, I should have brought my bucket of. Uh broken parts. <laughs> right, so then that leads, since you've got a, a much smaller footprint now, yeah, with and, your own PCB. And we didn't, uh, for this footprint, th these are uh, plans. We're still on the, the Soik 8 package with the 1.6 millimeter board. So with that is where we uh, start to step into the next things. Right, so walk me through these. What, yeah. what are these guys? Absolutely, so uh, I was bouncing around Amazon and I noticed these right here, it's it's meant to repair the ends of a USB-A connection or add one to the end of a cable. So like, you know, a a, uh, a fix-it kit, if you will, yeah. for USB that just kind of snaps together, right? Yeah. So basically, you would uh, solder on through those those contacts in there. Uh, you would solder on the, the four uh, cables of, of uh, the four, four, four lines of the main cable. Oh man, USB 2 is like the most dead stupid uh, pinout. I love it because it's like it's like Cat5. It's easy. Yeah. You, know? you don't even use half the wires. Well, on these you do use all yeah. four. Yeah, so uh, what I did is took, took one of those. I kind of carved out some extra space just because these boards are still thick. And then I uh, just dropped the actual PCB right inside of there. Wow, so that fits right in here. There's a lot of and, space still. And you can, I know, there's a ton of space. It's kind of crazy. Yep. Uh, and you flip that out, and there's your main IC. And I see you've like actually scratched out yeah. some just to make it fit. I needed like half a millimeter more of space. So. <laughs> right, which you wouldn't have if you went with the smaller package. Yeah. So maybe Or, or just a smaller the, board, right? That's, right? That's thickness right there. So that's, you know, and I can see where this is leading is like, oh, hey, this is like a USB boot that nobody would think there's you know, something inside of. I mean, you know, yeah. I know, for example, like right after the Ant Catalog leaked, Mike Osman was doing cool stuff with retro reflectors and like little wires inside yes. of uh, USB cables to exfiltrate stuff. How amazing is it to be able to like implant your own goodies inside of, I'm seeing that oh, yeah. going to a cable. Oh yeah. 
So let's, let's talk about cables. Yes, definitely. So this is you know, uh, uh, the, the first step into the cable itself. So I made a USB-C, or sorry, I made a USB-A to micro USB cable out of this. And you know, it just looks like a cable. You pick it up, it plugs in, acts like a ducky. Uh, great. Then uh, somebody said, hey, let's just use USB-C because it's smaller and you can't do anything inside of it. Naturally, uh, that made me want to look into the USB-C stuff. And here's our USB-C. Uh, this is, uh, again, another repair boot. Right so, in here. So you, can you tell the difference between the repair boot and, and an original? Because like if that's... It's pretty close in size. An original. It's a, it's a little bit bigger, but, yeah, but it's not, pretty close in not size. Not much bigger. It, it's, you're going to notice if they're side by side and you're staring at them, but if it's just this, this uh, on the end of uh, a cable, it's going to be a lot harder to notice. Wow. But right here... Uh, let's see if I can show this off. So the blue portion from here down is the actual USB-C end. From here up is the actual chip itself. So oh, wow. You can actually see if, if, if you yeah. put the PCB next to it, there it is. And then if we flip this over, you can see the backside of it. Okay, except in this case, we don't have the MOSFET. We don't have that, ah, yes. uh, you know, the resistance wire. So. Yes. Uh, it's not an exploding drive. Yes, I, I left okay. that off, uh, save space, and I'm kind of just reusing the boards here to have the really small package and drop it inside of the boots of cables. Uh, also, oh. I had a request to do uh, the official Apple lightning cables, which we can look at if you oh, like. Oh, right, right. So if this is your traditional Apple cable, let's just move these guys aside. Yeah, here we go. And then the repair boot, you can tell. Well, actually, this is like, okay, now pause the video and figure out which one's which. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, this is the repair boot, but when you put it next to the original cable, it's it's not that much fatter. Yeah. I definitely would fall for that. Uh, and I'm assuming you've done very similarly. You've, you've, yeah. you can basically put your little chip inside of there. Deep. Yep, exactly. Because that would fit. Yep, and I generally will uh, end up cutting off most of these contacts over here just for more space, because you really only need just the very edge of it to solder onto, and that will further allow space for activities within the cable. You know, speaking of activities, what I love is, you know, talking about the USB-C front, how, um, you know, I joke like, oh, you know, and um, clearly there isn't the wire for the explodey bit, but, you know, <laughs> this is, if this is a USB-C and there's power delivery and there's potentially 60 watts going through yes. this, I mean, is data passing through here when you're doing this? Does it still function as a, a regular cable yes, or is exactly. it the duck only? So it depends how you build it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got the lightning cables, for instance. I can either pass power or pass data through it. A uh, little work, I pr probably get both happening at the same time. Uh, the USB-C spec itself is a lot more complicated, so I've been a little more cautious with that. No joke, that's a crazy pen out. Yeah, exactly. I, I haven't jumped into it uh, too deeply yet. Um, I suspect I'll be able to at least get charge pass through, which would be great because the new Apple MacBooks for the last, I think, two years, they're using the USB-C ends mm -hmm. to charge the MacBook. So you've got a data line that you are charging your MacBook with. Oh, dude, it's becoming the de facto standard for, I mean, USB became the de facto standard for charging, like, hey, we can get five volts out of this thing, maybe an amp, maybe two amps. And, and now, finally, it's getting like, you know, properly certified, like, okay, here's the specification. It's called power delivery. Yay. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly, right? And uh, those, those things are going to be left in conference rooms. They're stationary objects, and if you leave an infected one in a conference room or a shared space, it's going to be an interesting situation. Yeah, and it's definitely one of those things that raises eyebrows and gets the powers that be to maybe think a little bit uh, more mindfully about endpoint device security and just the whole gamut. You know, yeah. I know that uh, a lot of these tools, are, including a lot of our tools, are just used for that kind of awareness because it is the physical manifestation of a hack. Yep. You know, it is the, okay, well, if I had 30 minutes at your computer, I could just like boop, 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 uh, but I don't. I've got 30 seconds, so plug and play. Yes, exactly. There's, there's a lot that can be done. It can be done at later times. There's so many options. So I, I love all of the ingenuity involved in here. And, I, and I've been watching this on Twitter uh, growing as, you know, from the Explodey Duck to, to here. Um, where can people continue to follow this journey? And if they're interested in doing some of their own stuff, 
uh, learn from your mistakes and your challenges and, and what you've co overcome. And yeah, definitely. Uh, my Twitter is underscore MG underscore. Uh, I post a lot of stuff up there, but I've been trying to keep a high level summary of a lot of that work at mg.lol. So those are the two places I would uh, suggest checking out. It's the best website ever. You can actually pick it up in, uh, uh, I was going to say Vi. No, you can pick it up in Emacs. No, you can pick it up in Lynx. Sorry, I'm just I'm like Pine, Elm. I'm running through every old Unix command. But yeah, brilliant um, Lynx compatible website there. Go and check out mg.lol. Uh, with that, I'm Darren.Kitchen for a cool TLD. Uh, and until next week. Trust your technicalist this time. Yeah, you got it. Trust your technicalist. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Domain.com has all your website needs, from .com and .net domains to intuitive website builders, so you can take that first step in creating your online identity. Let me tell you, there's no domain extension like a .com or a .net, or if you want to brand yourself, Domain.com has over 300 domain extensions like .club and .space. These guys are huge fans of Hack5. They're affordable, reliable. We've been using them for years. They've got all the tools you need to share your ideas with the world. And because they're such big fans, they are hooking you up with 15% off their already affordable prices. So get domain names and web hosting and email, and just be sure to use that coupon code HAK5. So when you think domain names, think domain.com.